Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 25. This is the story of how God Almighty went on an eternal search that was born of love and cost His blood, the story of His holy church. We were at first disembodied. Our limbs and bodies were active practitioners of misanthropy. We were fingers without hands, wrists with no arms, shoulders without chest, parts without form, heels with no foot, knees with no leg, toes with no step, appendages with no head. We were lost and stranded wanderers, doomed to die alone. But that was before God graciously left his throne. For as he was torn, we were mended. As he was ashamed, we were perfected. As he was ripped, we were sown. As he was opened, we were closed. And though the one true body is back on his throne, you may know that the one true body lives on here below. For his body did rise, yet in leaving it did not die, but lives on in the church, the unified body of Christ. But it wasn't just for a body that God sent his son to die. It was for an eternal companion. It was for a bride. As it is written, it is for this reason that man shall leave his father and hold fast to his wife. So the son left the father so that the two may become one flesh, may become one life. When we became Christians, we left our fathers for the husband and we all form the bride of Christ. But God goodness was not then done his plan not yet complete for he wanted to live with his new bride so he made his wife a building now we are living stones breathing bricks laughing lumber surviving sticks built bit by bit inch by inch together with every Christian the groom admits together we knit one on top of the other as we submit around the pillars of the apostles and prophets all coming to sit on the one foundation of Christ, the structure's magnet. We are the church, the only building no force in heaven nor on earth could purge. The ark that holds the eternal God, the temple that trembles with his spirit surge. We are the assembly of the saints, the congregation of the upright. We are where heaven inhabits. We are the fold of Christ. We are the temple. We are the city. We are the vineyard, the sanctuary. We are the body, we are the bride, we are the building, we are the church. We are the construction of eternity's eternal holy work. So we will never dismember the flesh. We will never divorce the wife. We will never dismantle the house. We will never dismiss the price. But we'll lay everything down for our everlasting tribe. For we are the church. We are the people. Today, we're going to declare once more on who we are, and this Sunday will not be on a metaphor that describes what we are like, but it's literally what we are. But first, we're going to look at a metaphor that describes this literal expression of who we are. In Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14, Jesus is teaching a parable known as a parable of the talents. Keep in mind, a talent was given based on their ability, but unlike in our language, talent is our ability. A talent was a form of money. It was generally worth possibly up to 10,000 denarii. A denarius or denarius was worth a day's wages. We kind of see remains of that expression in the Middle East with the Iraqi dinar, the means of exchange there. Now, the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. So before he left, he called these people that were his employees, people that lived under his care, under his roof, people that he fed, people that were cared for, and gave them some assignments to handle while he was gone. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So as soon as they received these things, he left. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. So he did business with these investments. Likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. 
But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you have delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you have delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said, well done, good and faithful servant. How many look forward to hearing the Lord say that to you one day? Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So the joy of the Lord was the Lord's joy. Enter in. I'm happy about this. Enjoy my joy. Then he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gathered where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we have three servants, each having ability. And invested with these servants, who each had ability, was an amount of money they could have handled. And they were given the same amount of time. Different amount of investment, but the same amount of time to work with this. They also received the same amount of care. They were servants. They lived under the roof of their master. They were cared for. They were his employees to work for him. They were given assignments. Two were profitable. One was called wicked, lazy, unprofitable. This is a parallel with, I believe, the life we have as believers. God gives us time, 86,400 seconds every day. He gives us abilities. And he gives us opportunities to do something with those abilities. For who? For our master. Can we pray? Lord, I ask you to speak to us today from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You are God's steward. Can you tell your neighbor, you are God's steward? What is a steward? The definition is one who is delegated to manage property or other affairs for someone else. A caretaker, a chamberlain, an officer, curator, representative, guardian, an attendant, an overseer, keeper, a trustee, an entrusted servant, a host or hostess. If you've ever flown commercial, you're cared for while in flight by a steward or stewardess or a plurality of such. And their responsibility is the passengers. The pilot's responsibility is the plane. So if a toilet overflows, a pilot doesn't come from his position and deals with it. No, the stewards have to take care of that. Uh, the pilot doesn't come back and check and make sure the passengers' seat belts are fastened or that their seats are all in an upright position. The steward and stewardesses take care of that. It's their responsibility. Our government has been appointed to take care of the governing of this country. The Secret Service has been given charge of overseeing the welfare of the highest leaders in the land. And we've seen some possible poor stewardship in the land, have we not? As God's steward, we want to be good stewards, don't we? 
So I'd like to speak on what makes us God's stewards, what makes us good stewards, and what are we stewards over. But first of all, let's lay a foundation. The foundation of our stewardship is based on two truths. First truth is God is a source of all good things. Can we say source? It all begins with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you ever wrestle with insomnia, I'll tell you how to cure it. Just begin to think of the source of your blessings. You may think, well, I have a good job. Okay, how'd you get that good job? How'd you get the ability for that job? How did you hear about that job? How were you educated where you could qualify for that job? Ultimately, you're going to rise back with your parents, and then the same thing with them. And as you continue following the chain back, you won't make it to Noah before you are sawing some serious logs. The children of Israel, on their journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, received this word from the Lord through Moses. When you get in this Promised Land, he told them, You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So the Lord blesses us with the ability to get wealth to establish his covenant. What is his covenant? His covenant is to bless his people. So to fulfill that, he is the one who gives us power. He's reminding them, you can't take all the credit. You can't say, it's by my hand that I've done this. God's the one that gave you the hand that works. He's the one that gives you sense enough to come in out of the rain. Ecclesiastes 5.19 says, As for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is the gift of God. So all blessings come from God. Some things we get in life don't ultimately come from God. Somebody took something God gave and then distorted it and bring harmfulness to others. Secondly, nothing in this world is mine permanently. So nothing originates with me. You hear about the potter said, well, I made this bowl. God didn't make this bowl. I made this bowl. And the Lord said, get your own dirt. (laughs) Nothing in this world is mine permanently. Look at our lives. James 4.13, come now you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. The Bible describes life is but a vapor. It seems like yesterday my father was my age that I am now. And now he's 78. Is today going to seem like yesterday when I hit 78? I don't know. The point is, life is short compared to eternity. And life is short. The older you get, the smaller percentage a year makes up of your life. And so life seems to fly, whereas when you were five, it seemed to drag, you know. When will Christmas ever get here? In reality, life is so short. And when it ends, nothing's going with us. We're leaving it all behind. A righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, the Bible says. You're not taking it with you. Oh, I'm going to. Well, somebody's going to dig up your grave and get that gold. Well, I'm taking my suit with me. Well, they could replace that suit with one of those burial suits where, you know, it's only this long and it only covers the front. What in the world is this? Looks like a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Hearses don't have trailer hitches. Here's a cartoon. One guy says to the other, I've always told my people, you can't take it with you. But Harry must not have been listening. A hearse with a trailer hitch. You are God's steward. There are examples of stewards in the Bible, people entrusted with stuff to take care of. Mary and Joseph were stewards of the baby Jesus. Eli was a steward of Samuel. When we're given children from God, we dedicate them to the Lord, and 
and recognize that we are stewards of these little kids. We can't keep them for their whole life. If we did, that wouldn't be healthy anyway, and they're going to buck against that. But we are stewards of our children, taking care of them until they are on their own. In Luke 12, the Lord talked about a faithful steward. In Luke 16, he talked about an unfaithful steward. Paul wrote in Romans 16 about a steward of a city named Erastus. Early church leaders were regarded as stewards of the mysteries of God, according to 1 Corinthians 4.1. In Ephesians 3.2, Paul said that he received a stewardship of grace for Ephesus. In Colossians 1.25, Paul said he was given stewardship to fulfill God's word. And Titus 1.7 says that a bishop or an overseer or an elder should be a blameless steward. Someone entrusted with something that does not belong to them is a steward. If someone loans you their car, you are a steward of that car to return it. And if you're a faithful steward, something will be improved with that car when they get it back. Someone lets you stay in their house. You're a steward of the room they let you use as long as you're there. You're a steward. If you rent a motel, you're a steward of that room that you're in until you check out. The thing I want to stretch our thinking with, everything in our life we're stewards of because it didn't originate with us and because we can't take it with us. So our ownership is temporary. Oh, I own my car. Yeah, well, give it 30 years. It won't be worth owning. Based on your stewardship, it can last 30 years, though. You're God's steward. What makes us God's stewards? Several things. Matthew 10, 8, we are blessed to bless. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. What we receive, we are to give from that. We are commissioned. We've been given a mission, all of us, not just the original disciples, to go and make disciples of all the nations. What are we doing with this mission that has been entrusted to us? What are we doing to help see it carried out? What are we doing? Last Sunday, we had an opportunity to hear about what God is doing in India, one of the neediest places on the planet. 1.2 billion people, the majority of them have never heard the gospel. What are we doing to help? We are workers with God. Just like the parable of those stewards, the master gave the servants the talents, and then them creating profits with those talents, They're working for the master, but also with him. He originally gave them what they had. We are God's fellow workers, 1 Corinthians 3, 9. You are God's field. You are God's building. Fellow workers. 2 Corinthians 6, 1. We then, as workers together with them, also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. God's given us grace to work with him. Let's not receive it in vain. Let's be good stewards. And one of the strongest points this morning is we are not our own. Well, I'm an American. Yes, you are. But even as an American, you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6.19, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Our body belongs to God. Verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So anything we do for the Lord, we're doing as his stewards. This is a humbling truth. And we have been given seed. His blessings include seeds that are to help others. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 10, may he who supplies seed to the sower... And bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. So we've been given seeds to sow and we've been given bread to eat. May we be faithful and wise to know the difference between the two and be faithful to sow the seed so that God can supply and multiply the seed we have sown and increase the fruits of our righteousness. You are God's stewards. May the Lord make us faithful ones. What are we stewards over? 
We're stewards over our world. The first man and woman heard these words in Genesis 1, verse 28. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. And all that God made was good. There was no need for gluten-free seed back then. It wasn't hybrid and jacked up and messed with molecularly. It was awesome stuff, healthy. And folks lived a long time back then. We're stewards over the gifts God has given us. First Peter 4.10 as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards. Can we say good stewards? Of the manifold grace of God. The word manifold, you know, we think of the exhaust manifold. You know, it's a place where exhaust goes and it diffuses it. But God's grace is manifold in its plurality of expressions. In its availability to us. And we are to be good stewards based on the gifts he's given us, to one another. We are stewards over our blessings. 2 Peter 1, verse 2, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. This verse says we've been given everything for life and godliness. Just like the master that gave five talents, the Lord has given us everything. Everything starts with him. Everything ultimately winds up with him. And if we train our children to be stewards, the things we leave to them in inheritance is going to continue on in seeing the Lord's will done on the earth. What are we stewards over? Our sufficiency. He's given us sufficiency for everything. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every work. Paul related in another place about the thorn in the flesh. The church has argued for centuries as to what the thorn was, and they completely missed the point. Pun intended. God's grace was sufficient for him when everything wasn't going his way. When things aren't going my way, I can still be a good steward because I have all sufficiency in him. This church in Corinth was giving towards needs in Jerusalem. The original church was suffering. The church in Corinth was suffering, but not as much. And so they were able, from the sufficiency the Lord gave them, to share an abundance with this church in Jerusalem. We've been given sufficiency. If your needs are met, you've got to be a good steward and make sure that you're blessing more than just yourself. And we are stewards over our time. Ephesians 5.15 tells us to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. 86,400 seconds every day is ours. We all have it to invest. And the difference in our lives is what we do with that time. One day our master is coming back and is going to ask us, what have you done with the opportunities I've given you within the time in which I've given you? 
Have you been faithful stewards? May the Lord grace us all to be able to hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant. What makes us good stewards? One thing, faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 4.2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. Faithful. Faithful to do with what you got, what you can, for whoever you can. Faithfulness. Can we say faithful? Faithfulness with little things. Luke 16, 10 through 12 covers three of these things. Jesus said, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Little things were important. Faithfulness in money makes us good stewards. Verse 11. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Jesus did talk about money. I've heard he talked about money more than he talked about heaven. Even though he came to make a way for us to go to heaven, he still talked about money because money is connected to our hearts. The time and effort we spend with our lives to receive money, to make money, it's not really making money, but receiving that in exchange for our labors, it's dear to us because it's our blood, sweat, and tears that went into earning that. So it's dear to us. It's an expression of our personality. It's ours. And the Lord, who's after our hearts, talked about money and said if we're not faithful with money, we really can't be faithful with anything. True riches are entrusted to those who are faithful with unrighteous riches. What makes us good stewards? Faithfulness with another's things, someone else's stuff. If you have not been faithful in that which is another's man's, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? If we borrow something from someone, we need to return it in as good a shape, if not better, than what we borrowed it. Faithfulness with another's. And if you're or having to live when no one's willing to loan you anything, think back. What have you done when they did loan you something? Did you burn them? <laughs> May the Lord help us to be faithful with the truth. Now think with me here. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.4 Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. The word edify has the word oikos in it, which is a house, a household. When you build up a house, oikotome, edify. Dome, edify, build, oikos, house, house, dome. Put the two together, you get edification. The word for steward in the New Testament also has oikos in it. And in this case, the word steward actually could translate just as well, if not better. Nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly stewardship, which is in faith. We only have so much time with our lives, and we can get lost in being experts at all kinds of stuff. Experts at science fiction, experts in romance fiction, experts in fantasy fiction, experts in our family tree. Experts in debating, winning arguments. All those things have their place in enjoying life. But is it really wise stewardship to become experts at things that are just going to burn up? Godly stewardship of our time and efforts should be priority. What has God given you? What ability has he given you? Are you becoming good at it? If he's given you the ability to sing, my goodness, develop that gift. If a door opens to exercise that gift, 
Exercise it. Well, Carnegie Hall hasn't called. Well, that's fine. Go to Trinity Mission. There's openings there every day. Exercise your gift to edify others, to be a blessing. Faithfulness with one another. 1 Peter 4. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You have a house, use it for the Lord. You have abilities that are unique to you, use them for the Lord. I'm finding out on Wednesday night we got some men that can preach, men that can teach. Are you being a good steward of that gift? Are you walking in the calling the Lord has walked you? I bet there's some senior pastors in this room. You're burying your talent. And I wouldn't be a good steward if I wasn't challenging us. It's not about how many people we can get in these seats, but how many people we can get in the kingdom by getting the the, the gifts exercised, you know. We need more churches in our city, more churches in our state, more churches around the world, because each church is an entrance into the God's kingdom and His kingdom ways. Can I get an amen? Amen. You are God's steward. Stewardship. It's kind of a churchy word, but what does it mean? This is stewardship plain and simple. Meet John. He loves to play golf, eat Italian, and go to the movies. He has a house, a car, and a job that pays the bills. In his free time, he catches up on the latest game, and he plays his guitar. So here's where stewardship comes in. Everything John has, from his TV, to his car, to even his ability to play guitar. Well, none of it actually belongs to him. Are you ready for this? From the little things, all the way to the big stuff, like his house. It all belongs to God. You're a steward of everything God gave you. It's a privilege, and he expects you to be responsible, not just with your finances, but your time, talents, and toys. So what does it mean to be responsible? Well, like hosting a Bible study at your house, or using your free time to visit someone in the hospital, or how about giving money to an out-of-work friend? It's all stewardship. So when it's time to give back, say the plate gets passed or the children's minister asks you to serve in the toddler's room again, think to yourself this one simple question. Does what I have belong to me or God? Today's note card in your bulletin ends with application time. If you have a pen, complete this statement. As a result of hearing this, I now see that I need to make an adjustment in my life in this area, in this. I see that I've said no where I shouldn't have. Or I see that I should say yes here, or I see that I have not been thankful, approaching the Thanksgiving season here, for the opportunities given to me, or I've not appreciated my abilities because because I'm not Pavarotti, I'm not willing to use my country voice. Or because I'm not a Zane Gray, I'm not willing to use my ability to write encouraging words to people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts with this word. Lord, help it to apply every heart. And I pray, Lord, for that person who's wrestling with trusting you. And the lack of trust has caused them to hold back. Pray, Lord, that they would jump out of the boat of distrust 
onto the waters of faith. I pray, Lord, for that one that's holding back because of fear. Or I pray, Lord, for that person that has ability, but they've not worked hard to develop it. I pray, Lord, they would look for opportunities to improve the skills you have given them. In Jesus' name. May everyone in this room one day hear you say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Yeah.